Earlier this year, the CEO of Toyota announced a new ammonia engine, and the internet went wild. I mean, AI content farms went wild anyway. So according to the reports, he claimed that this was going to be the death of EVs, which I looked, I don't think he actually said that, but uh, yeah, ammonia engines. Toyota will literally do anything to not make an EV. So what's the actual truth behind this? Why ammonia? And why filling up your tank with ammonia could kill you? Yeah, there are flaws in this plan. But I'm going to look at that, plus why our soil is losing its nutrients, the worst storm of all time, and a little follow-up to the whole Earth with Rings thing. Coming up in today's lightning round video. For those who might be new to this channel, lightning round videos are where I take questions from people on Patreon who are supporting at a certain level and answer them on here. So if you'd like to get a question answered, just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Fishtail asked, how viable are the ammonia internal combustion engines? It is hard to believe the hype that they will make EVs obsolete. Okay, so I looked this up and there's a ton of videos from these like, AI content farm channels that are claiming that the Toyota CEO said that this was uh, the end of EVs. And I can't find that quote anywhere originally, so I don't know if he actually said that or not. The only actual news source that I could find, the only actual article, uh, was in Bloomberg behind a paywall, because of course. All the other sites that I found were these kind of like no-name sites like Engine Labs and Car Scoops, which I don't say that to be, you know, offensive to them or anything, but they're not the original sourcing. Now, I did find a decent article from Motor Trend from June. Now, most of the articles that I found were from October. Clearly, there was like a whole trend happening then. But here's what I was able to figure out from that. Okay, first of all, it's not Toyota that developed this. It's a Chinese company called GAC that Toyota owns a stake in. But what they've done is developed a car engine that, yeah, it can run on ammonia. But why ammonia? Well, simply put, ammonia energy storage is basically hydrogen energy storage. Ammonia is NH3, meaning that one molecule of ammonia is one nitrogen and three hydrogen atoms. And one letter that you don't see in there is C. There is no carbon in ammonia, meaning it is a zero carbon fuel. Sort of. I'll get to that in a second. So just like hydrogen, ammonia is combustible, so you can just kind of use it in a regular internal combustion engine, or you can strip the hydrogen off of it and run it through a fuel cell. Now the advantage of ammonia over just using hydrogen is that ammonia can be stored in liquid form at room temperature. That requires a lot of pressure, obviously, but it's basically the same as what we do to store propane. Now hydrogen, on the other hand, has to be chilled to just above absolute zero to become liquid, which is obviously not feasible in a lot of cases, so it's usually stored in tanks as a highly pressurized gas. And that gas can be tricky to store because hydrogen atoms are so small, it's almost impossible to prevent leaks. So ammonia in a liquid state is going to be a lot more energy dense and easier to transport than hydrogen. And it's carbon free. Sounds great. There are problems. First of all, there are emissions, namely nitrogen. Now nitrogen is abundant in our atmosphere. In fact, it makes up 79% of Earth's atmosphere, but that's in the form of N2. The free nitrogen atoms in this exhaust is free to just combine with all kinds of things in the atmosphere and form all kinds of compounds that might not be great for us to breathe, including you know, just turning right back into ammonia. So yeah, that's that's kind of the other problem with ammonia is that it's highly toxic, like it's really bad stuff. Yeah, if you don't believe me, um, I would show you a picture of what anhydrous ammonia does to the human skin, uh, but I'm sure I would get demonetized. So yeah, feel free to pause the video and, and look up anhydrous ammonia burn on Google. I'll wait. Actually, while you're doing that, I guess I could talk about the difference between ammonia and anhydrous ammonia. So like the ammonia that you buy at the store in your cleaning supplies is heavily diluted in water. Um, it's kind of like when you buy hydrogen peroxide and put it in your medical cabinet, it's super diluted, but pure hydrogen peroxide is literal rocket fuel. Well, pure ammonia is called anhydrous ammonia because anhydrous means there's no water in it. Uh, it it's Greek, and meaning no, hydrous meaning water. Which is kind of confusing because uh, hydrous sounds like hydrogen and there's definitely hydrogen in there. Anyway. Anhydrous ammonia is used mostly in farming. Um, they spray it on their fields as a fertilizer to put nitrogen in the soil. But not good for human skin, which is why you can find multiple safety videos regarding anhydrous ammonia on YouTube, and they are not messing around. Ammonia is extremely hydrophilic, meaning it will draw in water, and since your skin is 70% water, it will pull the water out of your skin. It's kind of like a frostbite. And just to add injury to injury, when it combines with that water, it turns into ammonium hydroxide, which is extremely alkaline and will create a caustic burn. 
And lastly, if it's liquid ammonia that you spilled on yourself, that liquid ammonia will Im immediately vaporize because the pressure has dropped. And as it vaporizes into a gas, it pulls heat out of the air, freezing the air around it, and it will give you an actual frostbite. And then once it's in the air as a gas, guess what happens when it comes into contact with the water in your eyeballs or in your lungs? Chemical burn. Yeah, it's, uh, it's bad stuff. Yeah, so now imagine this is what you fuel your car with at extremely high pressure, no less. I mean, just, just, just think of all the times you've been at the gas station and just like dribbled a little gasoline on your shoe because you were tired or you weren't paying attention or something like that. This would be like that, except, you know, you'd go to the hospital. Surveillance video shows the moment yesterday afternoon when more than 1,300 gallons of gasoline were spilled, all caused when this SUV ran into the pump. Or, hey, uh, imagine two cars with large tanks full of this stuff colliding into each other at 70 miles an hour. Now, I could talk about things like the fact that um, it's actually not a very powerful fuel. It doesn't give you a lot of horsepower in this engine. Um, it also wouldn't get a whole lot of range for a tank of, of fuel. But to be fair, you know, this is a brand new technology. I'm sure they'll improve on that. Now, this is just my hot take, but I, I feel like the fact that it is so dangerous and toxic, it kind of takes it out of the running to be the fuel of the future in passenger cars anyway. Um, I do think it has other uses though, like possibly replacing diesel fuel and shipping. Cargo ships, they've got plenty of room to store ammonia and house the fuel cell or combustion engines required. Uh, they scale a lot easier than cars. And the only people handling the fuel would be trained professionals, not some hungover office worker who's late for a meeting. Now, one more thing that ammonia does have going for it is that we already make massive amounts of the stuff. The infrastructure is already there. Now, the problem with that is the hydrogen that we're using to make the ammonia. And again, this is the same problem that plagues the, the potential hydrogen economy that everybody's talking about, is that most hydrogen is made by methane steam reforming, which, say it with me, releases tons of CO2, which is why I put an asterisk next to that zero carbon label earlier. And yes, there are clean ways to get hydrogen uh, out of water with electrolysis and whatnot, but we've really struggled to get that to occur at scale. So yeah, until we can figure that out, you know, in my opinion anyway, hydrogen and ammonia are really more like fossil fuels than clean fuels, except these will burn the crap out of you. So yeah, I think for larger cargo use cases, ammonia maybe has a place, uh, maybe even as a storage medium for hydrogen, but whatever its use may be, this idea of them going into cars yeah, consider me skeptical. Sai asked, I've heard our foods are getting less nutrient dense. I assume this is at least partially due to us overutilizing our soils. What is the state of nutrients in our soils? Curious how this varies country to country. So I couldn't find anything that talked about um, different soil density and nutrients throughout uh, various countries and whatnot, uh, but I did find an article from National Geographic that talks about all the other stuff. So right up here at the top, you can see it says, mounting evidence shows that many of today's whole foods aren't as packed with vitamins and nutrients as they were 70 years ago, potentially putting people's health at risk. So right off the bat, good times. It says they show declines in protein, calcium, and phosphorus, which are essential for building and maintaining strong bones and blah, blah, blah. Also dips in iron, vital for carrying oxygen throughout the body and in riboflavin. Also vitamin C has gone down. Declines in iron content ranging from 30 to 50% occurred in sweet corns, red skin potatoes, cauliflower, green beans, green peas, and chickpeas. And they also make the point that um, this doesn't just uh, affect vegetarians and people who only eat vegetables, that it, there's a, a knock-on effect for meat eaters when the, the animals eat these less dense foods and then we eat those animals. So in this section here, they talk about um, some of the causes for it, like why this is happening. And one of the big ones is that farmers get paid by crop yields, so they optimize for crop yield. But the problem is the more food you plant in a certain area, there's only so many nutrients to go around. Therefore, all the food has less nutrients because there's only so much to spread apart. They also point out that soil damage is a big culprit. They point out specifically that there's fungus in the soil that is a, kind of like a macronutrient kind of thing and it helps to distribute nutrients to all the different plants and stuff. Well, tilling up the soil too much keeps breaking up that fungi so it can't grow and do its thing. They talk about how rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are also undercutting the nutritiousness of the foods. So this kind of goes against the argument that you always hear people say that like carbon dioxide is plant food. Or as it says right here, all plants have photosynthetic pathways through which they bring in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere break it apart and blah, blah, blah. But when the crops are exposed to higher level of carbon dioxide, they generate more carbon-based compounds, which leads to a higher carbohydrate content. 
In addition, when concentrations of carbon dioxide are higher, the crops draw in less water, which means they bring in fewer micronutrients from the soil. And honestly, I did not know that before I looked that up. I didn't realize that there were specific damages that were being done to plants by higher CO2. So that was news to me. Now, as for solutions, they recommend things like regenerative agriculture, which I've done a video on. I'll pop it up here or put it down uh, in the description. These are basically using natural practices to replenish nutrients in the soil so that it's not, you know, having the problems that we're having right now. Now, again, I looked for a country by country analysis because I was curious about that myself. I couldn't find anything specifically on that, but I did see a lot of articles on the economic disparity between different countries and how that affected people's diets. Uh, that's a whole other argument that I don't really want to get into, but uh, yeah, I imagine countries that employ more crop rotation and regenerative practices would probably have higher density uh, nutrition foods. And they also make the point, I always hear people say that when they go to Europe or something that the food just tastes so much better there than it does over here in the States. And that's partly because a lot of these nutrients do have sort of flavor profiles that come along with them. And so if there's less nutrients in it, the more bland the food is gonna taste. So if you feel like the food is getting more bland than maybe it was when you were a kid, well, you're, you're probably not making that up. John asked, do you have plans for the 2024 eclipse? Uh, we don't have any specific plans right now, but I do plan to do something. It might be a live stream for everybody on here, or um, we're thinking about maybe coordinating with, a, with an observatory or something and, and doing something fun. Because as it happens that, uh, you know, I'm here in Dallas and this total eclipse is actually gonna be coming right over Dallas. So this is like the best place, one of the best places in the country to be. Watch it be totally overcast that day if I know my luck, but uh, no, we, we're gonna do something, but nothing specific as planned. Donna Sawyer wrote, would you consider doing an episode based on Scott Carney's Vortex? I really enjoyed the podcast with him eight months ago and thought that his book would be all over the place by now, but it doesn't seem to have grown the legs that I thought this interesting story, natural disaster, genocide, nuclear war, would have generated. Uh, well, Donna, you're, you're in luck because I, I did do a video on that and I included clips from the podcast and that I recorded with uh, Scott on there. Uh, in fact, I did two videos. There was a, a video about the Bola cyclone, which was the worst storm in human history. But I also did a video about um, the genocide that followed that went on Nebula. So there were actually, there were actually two videos <laughs> that went along with it. I'll put the links down in the description. Uh, but to answer your question, I did get to hang out with Scott fairly recently. I took a trip out to Colorado and he lives out there. So we had lunch together and, and I was asking him about that. Um, about, you know, kind of where things went with that book and whatnot. And uh, you know what? Why don't I just get him on the phone and uh, let him tell you himself? I don't know. You like, like <laughs> here's the thing. When you, when you put a book out, it's this, it's, this, it's this thing you put into the ether and you hope that the ether is like, I love this book. I think it was like, I think it's like my best book in a lot of ways. But I will say, even if the sales have not been like through the roof, um, which they haven't. Um, uh, there is a, a like a, there's a like a, I got a deal in Hollywood to maybe make it into a movie, which is really sounds really awesome, but it's usually a total a lie and nothing ever happens. But they did reach out to me, and there's some directors and stuff looking at it, so that's cool. That feels good. Yeah, it's gonna be like Chernobyl. You know, it's gonna be HBO's Chernobyl, and then people will finally realize that this event, which um, you know, kill the half a million people and almost ended in nuclear war is actually something we should pay attention to. Because I think that, I don't know, is climate change important? Do people care about climate change? I feel like it's relevant. I mean, you can't really ask an author, why didn't your book do well? And like, have them like, well, here's the reason. I wrote it. Yeah. Story, right? Like, no one says <laughs> I wish that. I could do that with all my videos. <laughs> exactly. You beautiful listeners who are looking at this, um, Buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> Buy my book, please. Brian Beswick wrote, all right, Joe, I just watched your latest episode on Nebula and you sold me. Earth rings would be epic. So could we over time artificially create Earth rings by capturing asteroids and maneuvering them inside the Roche limit? Mega project. Um, did you watch the video? Because <sighs> I mean, even the thumbnail says it would be extremely bad. I, I don't think this is a good idea. Like, especially with all the space infrastructure we've already put up there, adding rings would basically do away with a lot of that. I mean, I made the point that a lot of low Earth orbit satellites would go underneath the, the rings probably, but um, there's a lot of stuff in, I guess, the mid range that the rings would, yeah, would not make, it would, they would not be possible. 
Yeah, something tells me if we're gonna go through the effort of, of moving asteroids around, we'll probably be mining them. I mean, there's, there's not really any money in making rings. Although the whole Roche limit thing means that any, you know, asteroid mining would probably be deep space activities because we wouldn't be able to move it into low Earth orbit without possibly it breaking apart. Although I would add eventually onto that because I'm sure that the breaking apart of an asteroid, especially into rings, is not something that would happen right away. It probably takes thousands of years for the stresses to tear it apart enough for it to break apart and probably hundreds of thousands of years for those pieces to smash and shatter together and turn into full on rings. So yeah, I would, I would call that a flaw in the plan that the people who, you know, are, are, are funding the effort to move these asteroids around would never actually see the rings themselves. Now, if the question is whether or not, you know, technically we could do this, um, I mean, no, not right now. Like we just showed with DART that we can affect the trajectory of an asteroid, which is big, but um, being able to actually just move it to a specific place, that's, that's a whole other thing. Um, I mean, I'm sure we could figure it out. So yeah, I mean, if we ever decided to put massive resources into destroying our space infrastructure and everything that comes along with it for the chance that someday our distant descendants, who assuming they don't wipe themselves out, maybe a totally different species by now, might, might see rings in the sky, we might do it. Or you could just, you know, go watch my video again. I'd say that's the better option. If, you know, saving the world is important to you. If you're one of those people. Actually, you know, if you are one of those people, good for you. The world can't be a better place without people trying to make it a better place. Which is actually a good opportunity to talk about today's sponsor, 80,000 Hours. So let's say you're young and trying to find your place in the world, or, or, or maybe you've got the career you always wanted, but now you feel unfulfilled and are maybe looking for a change. If you just knew where to look, 80,000 Hours is the place to look. Their one purpose is to help people find careers and fields that would make the most positive impact on the world. And it's not always what you might think. I mean, <laughs> The, the good thing about being a problem solver is that there's a lot of problems in the world. So job security, but this is what they do. They look at the biggest problems in the world and in society and identify which jobs would most help fix those problems. So look, if you've got something you like to do, maybe something you're good at or have experience with, they'll find a way to match those skills with a quality, meaningful career that will make the world a better place. All this is free, by the way, and they've got loads of content on their site if you want to learn more about, you know, changing careers, more about getting an idea of what major problems they're focusing on, or just go check out the job board and see what companies are hiring. They've also got an eight-week career planning course that you can take and a podcast where they interview experts about how we can face the various problems facing the world. It's a great company, and the name, by the way, it's, it's a reference to the fact that most people spend about 80,000 hours working throughout the course of their careers. So how are you going to spend your 80,000 hours? Just go to 80,000hours.org slash Joe Scott to get their free in-depth career guide, which can help you to learn what makes a high impact career, get ideas for a new path for yourself, and then put that plan into action. Yeah, I'll put the link down in the description and I'll pin it in the comments. But again, it's 80,000hours.org slash Joe Scott. Uh, go take a look. You might learn something. All right, thanks for watching and a big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon and the new channel members who have helped make an awesome community and keeping the lights on around here. They've been a great springboard for ideas and whatnot, fact checking. I can't thank you guys enough. There are some new members I need to shout out real quick. We've got OYT0724, very clever name. Uh, danny 68 a Bimnus, Grumpy and Stitch the Newbie Gamers, <laughs> Shane Abel, Zero Fox, Gus Drulius, Kervin, Steven Vlass, Stormy Fever 58, and Seamus Delaney, or maybe that's Seamus Delaney. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos, get access to exclusive live streams, and get a little thing by your name in the comments to make you stand out like the special person you are, just hit the join button down below. If this is your first time here, I suggest maybe checking out this video because it's uh, something that Google has been following you around and has decided that this is something you might want to watch. Check that out if you enjoy it. Maybe look at any of the others that might show up in your web browser on the side over there. And if you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. Come back with videos every Monday. But that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.